Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining the Fireside Chat with Barbara Morgan. Um, I am Jill Olson from EIE at the Museum of Science in Boston, and I am honored to be able to introduce uh, Barbara, Barbara Morgan, a, a fascinating human being. Um, before I do that, I just wanted to remind you that throughout the conversation, you know, she's really excited to engage with the audience and answer any questions that you might have. So please do be sure to go ahead and drop those questions into the discussion section of the platform. So without further ado, um, an introduction of Barbara Morgan. Barbara Morgan is an educator and a retired NASA astronaut. She is the public elementary school teacher who trained with the Challenger crew as the backup for teacher in space Krista McAuliffe, then later served as a NASA astronaut. Morgan is now a distinguished educator in residence emeritus at Boise State University. Morgan earned her bachelor's degree in human biology from Stanford University and her teaching credentials at College of Notre Dame. She taught public school for 24 years, including in the Bay Area in California, on the Flathead Indian Reservation in Montana, in a small mountain town in Idaho, and a Colegio Americano in Quito, Ecuador. In 1985, Morgan and Krista McAuliffe were selected to train with the Space Shuttle Challenger crew for NASA's Teacher in Space program. Following the tragic Challenger disaster, Morgan returned to her classroom teaching while taking on the duties of NASA's teacher in space designee, including public speaking, educational consulting, curriculum design, and serving on the National Science Foundation's Federal Task Force for Women and Minorities in Science and Engineering. Morgan transitioned from her 24 year career as a public school teacher to a 10 year career as an astronaut in 1998 when she was selected by NASA as a mission specialist and NASA's first educator astronaut. At Johnson Space Center, she served in the Space Station Operations Branch and the Capcom Branch as prime communicator with on-orbit crews and in the Robotics Branch, supporting current and future robotics operations on crewed missions. Morgan launched into space in August of 2007, serving onboard Space Shuttle Endeavor, named by America's school children on STS-118, 5.3 million mile, 13 day mission to help construct the International Space Station. Her duties included operating the space shuttle and space station robotic arms, serving as loadmaster, assisting the pilots with re entry and landing, and teaching lessons from orbit to school children on Earth. Morgan retired from NASA in 2008 to become distinguished educator in residence at Boise State University where she represented the university and provided vision and leadership to the state of Idaho, primarily in STEM education. Her work included policy and program development, advocacy and mentoring. Morgan continues to work with Boise State University, national and international education organizations, NASA and nonprofits. She champions a vision of STEM education that engages all students and encourages them to dream of being astronauts, engineers, scientists or STEM teachers. I'm thrilled to introduce to you all Barbara Morgan. Perfect. Thank you for that. So go ahead, Barbara. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Jill. And uh, hi, Kelly. And uh, greetings, Earthlings. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I, what I'd really like to say is greetings, pioneers, because you guys are real pioneers, pioneers for education. And how do we know uh, by the importance of their challenge? That's one way. By the risks that they take, by their bravery, that's another way. By their commitment to change and to new ideas and to lead the way, that's how we know pioneers. And so I just want you to know I'm really thrilled to be here with all of you pioneers doing great work in education. And a uh, special uh, thanks to Kelly and Roy and Sal and Rosa for pulling this all together for all of us. It's great leadership and uh, very much appreciated. Well, thank you for that, Barbara. You've been a terrific part and a longtime friend in terms of supporting all of this work. So it's great. So I want to just jump right into this. And first, I want to say to everyone, ask your questions. This is a really great opportunity in this forum that we're going to ask Barbara all sorts of questions that are out there. So what are some of the most pressing things that you ever wanted to ask um, an astronaut? But also, I think the thing that Barbara's most proud of is being an educator. 
and that lifelong learning there. So with that, Barbara, I'm going to kind of jump right into this um, and to say, you know, um, why don't you talk just a little bit about your experience from being an educator to becoming an astronaut and that whole transition there of what happened. If you could just share some of your story, we'd love to hear that. Sure. Um, What I'd like to say first about that is uh, some people think that it's a, uh, oh, like a, um, an advancement or whatever, but I want to say all it is and all it was was a lateral move because the job of being an astronaut and the job of being a teacher are really so, so similar. It's all about learning, lifelong learning, exploration, discovery, and sharing, 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 and trying to help make the world a better place. And um, and there's just nothing more important than doing that in education where we're trying to help every single child reach his or her full potential. So I know I didn't quite answer the question, Kelly, but, but I want everybody to know it's a lateral move. <laughs> So, Barbara, one of the things when you were in space, and I've heard you talk about this before, could you share with us when you're in space and you're, you're, you know, first of all, you're going up in the shuttle there, then you land at the um, ISS. What was the most awe experience there? When was the moment where you were kind of like pinching yourself saying, is this real? Oh, my God. Um, so it seems every moment is an awe moment. So it's hard to pick out one specifically, but when you, for example, when you're sitting on the launch pad, you you practice this over and over. You know, we've, and I think you heard uh, my uh, colleague and, and dear friend Steve Swanson talk about this yesterday. You know, you've been training, 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 so you're well trained. And um, when you're on that launch pad, you kind of know what to expect, but uh, but there's always some surprises. And one of my first surprises and my first awe moment was when we took off the pad, I had no idea what I'd be thinking other than I knew that I would be paying very close attention to everything that I was supposed to be paying attention to. But the first thing that popped up into my head, first of all, my crewmates were all going, woohoo, <laughs> because it's quite a ride. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all whooping and hollering inside, having a good time, um, as we're paying attention. But the first pop thing that popped into my mind, and it actually surprised me, was finally, we are on our way. And I was, in, in three days, we're going to get to the International Space Station and help construct it. And I was so excited about that and and that wasn't what I expected to you know I I didn't know what would pop into my mind but that's the thing that popped into my mind was finally finally we're on our way and I can't wait to get to the International Space Station and I had this huge smile on my face and when you are launching and you are accelerating to 17,500 miles an hour which is about five miles a second you're you you're experiencing three G's or for three times Earth's gravity. And I had this huge smile on my face and I've got to say it was really plastered. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that. Woo there. So and then, um, then once we got into space, my my first uh, biggest awe moment was um, when 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 we first had a chance to float over to the window and look out. I was really shocked by the blackness of space. And um, it's a, and I know Kelly, you've heard me say this, uh, talk about this before, but it's a blackness that I've never seen on earth. So I was thinking, how how do you describe this when it's something you've never seen? So I was trying trying to figure out what it looked like. And one of the big surprises, because I'd seen thousands of photographs that, you know, that we've all seen astronauts take on on missions. But, and they all look bright and shiny. It was a really flat black. And that was a big surprise. Almost like, um, in, we don't see this very much anymore, but the old black and white film that you could see, it's kind of that flat black on, on those old uh, uh, negatives. And, uh, and I thought, okay, well, uh, like flat black paint. But it... It's not like that that paint because you can see right through it. You're looking through a vacuum and that vacuum just goes on forever and ever and ever. You really see the depth of the universe. 
and and when I was looking at this and thinking about it, I realized, wow, it looks like it has a texture to it, and it looks so smooth. So I was thinking, well, maybe it's like velvet, but it doesn't have that nappy feel to it. So the best I can come up with, and you guys, you better use your imagination for this one, but it, it looked like a creamy black, and I don't mean like creamy black coffee because it was pitch black and and a very flat black, but it looks so creamy. So. Ah, mm. uh, that's great. So, and I, I think of that because I've heard you describe that before. And so when I see kind of, you know, you look up at the sky at night and you think, gosh, how would that blackness look, right? You know, so it's like, it, it's it's amazing. So something that I, I always think about when I'm outside looking up at the stars there. So one of the questions that um, actually came up was about your collaboration there. So here you train and you train and you train with this team and you come at it from a very different lens. You're coming at it from being an educator. So talk about that collaboration because you have engineers, you have scientists, doctors, all of these other folks. And then you're kind of coming at it from you had to teach students how to collaborate. You taught everyone how to work together. And so share that experience with us. Yeah. So, um, in, uh, oops, I'm getting a feedback. So I don't know. There we go. Okay. So, um, yeah, that collaboration is really, really important. And what's even more important to me than that is the diversity of the team. And Steve Swanson talked about that yesterday, too, I believe. That diversity is so important. And, um, you know, it's interesting. So we all come with different backgrounds. And, and starting from the very get-go, uh, I, I guess, I'll, can I do this by telling a couple stories, maybe? Okay, so from the very get-go, we're sitting in uh, our, there, there were, um, uh, there were uh, 30 of us in our astronaut class. Steve Swanson and I were in the same class. So we all did all of our classes together. We spent two years together. Uh, we helped each other out. Um, I think I heard Steve mention things like when we were studying certain systems, each of us took responsibility for one of those systems and we would learn I mean, we all learned everything we could, but we especially focused on a on a certain system. Like I, I focused on the on the um, on the uh, Ohm's engines or the orbital maneuvering system engines and the reaction control jets. So I tried to really delve deeply into that, and then created these kind of cheat sheets. And everybody did this, and then we all shared that information with each other. It was a lot of sharing and helping each other out. I remember. Um, when we were going to do a, uh, uh, we were going to have sessions on how to work with the media and how to help get your message across. And I remember a couple of my classmates who knew that I had spent years from years earlier doing this kind of stuff uh, came to me uh, really worried and nervous about it and asking for help in the same way that I was asking them for help in how do I really learn the electrical system when my understanding of electricity is teaching third graders, you know, how to build, uh, how to build basic circuits with, with um, foil and M&Ms and, 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 think, and think, not foil and M&Ms, but foil and Hershey Kisses and switches, things like that. So we all bring different things to the, to the, uh, to the team, to the mission. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to kind of tie that back for a minute to why this work that we're doing here at the summit is so important because it brings in so many different voices and, and it's going to take everybody. It's such a complex issue. It's going to take everybody working together to really push, push this and move the needle on, on this great work. Um, the other thing I want folks to know is just like we work in our classrooms to build the best team that we can, where the students are, helping each other out and learning together and really sticking up for each other so that everybody can succeed. That's exactly what happens in our, in the astronaut world. So uh, we do a lot of work. We take classes on what we call um, SFR, SFRM or space flight resource management, 
what that is is a real fancy word. I know the airline industry uses something like it too. So um, um, our, our speaker from Southwest Airlines, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name right now. He was fabulous, but knows all about it. Great. Yeah, great. So um, apologies to Greg. So um, we spend a lot of time working on what is it that makes a good team. And we work really hard on trying to make the most effective team that we can. And an example of that, when we're, let's say, once we're assigned to a mission and we're working with our own team that's flying, along with our team in mission control and in launch control, because there's a lot of people, it's a much bigger team than just those few people that are in the shuttle or that are on the International Space Station. But when we're going for our simulations and practicing over and over again what we're going to be doing on orbit and also having all these uh, emergencies thrown out, at us so that we can figure out what are all the things that can go wrong and how are we going to take care of it. At the end of each of those simulations, which may last two hours, they may last four hours, we always spend time, we stop and we go around with each one of us and talk about what went well, what didn't go so well, what did we do individually that either helped or didn't help. So we're constantly constantly working at how do we make the most effective team that we can. And it's a, it's hard work. It does not come natural. It doesn't come natural in the classroom. It's something you have to work really hard at. And believe it or not, all these, uh, you know, all these astronauts who are, you know, experts in medicine or chemical science or, or geology or engineering, you know, you name it, they don't naturally come together. Uh, and make just immediately make an effective team. It takes a lot of work and concerted effort. Yeah, yeah, and that it's true. I mean, I think any team in any environment you are, it does take work. It's not just a okay, we're going to work together. Here we go. You know, we're all excited, but you you really have to learn how to play off of each other's strengths. Um, and then how do you really kind of come across as a group, which really leads nicely into um, one of the questions. Yeah. Sorry, can I just ask one thing? Yeah. You said, and that is that what makes a difference on all of this is, and, and, and I really thought about this a lot as I've been listening to all the presentations and participating in them because it's such a massive problem and there are so many different parts to it whether it's the teacher in the classroom and whether they have a voice or not, whether it's the students, whether it's the administration, whether it's uh, collab you know, the, the business and industry or trying to help collaborate and all that. But um, it, it's, it's focusing on not individuals, but and not what makes the team really come together is what's the ultimate goal? How do you have a successful mission? And, and that the, that the success of the mission is more important than any single part of it. And, and that helps drive that, uh, those collaborations to be successful, I think. That's really great. I, I love that you said that because oftentimes you're right. We get focused on my contribution, my role, where it's not about that. And I think that transforms first really nicely into education, right? You know, it's about the the students that are there. Um, and this conversation here, it really leads nicely into one of the questions that we had. And I, the question is around, you know, what skills, whether it's 21st century soft skills, I call them essential skills, whatever skills you want to call them, or content-based, did you pull most from your K-12 education and I look at that question that's asked, Barbara, and I think one of the things, I feel like I could answer this for you, but of course I'm going to let you answer it. One of the things you, well, one of the things you taught me was this whole level around patience. And I think of you with your, your third grade class and, and, you know, it's one of those skill sets that it doesn't matter what's coming at you. There's a level of patience and calmness that you've always had. And, I learned that from you, that as things come fast at you, to kind of breathe, Kelly, and take it slow there, right? And so you have always been one of those people. It doesn't matter how long the line is, 
you make that person you're with feel like they are the most important, valuable person in the whole wide world. Because so, I know, and you're so marvelous at it. So I want to just turn that question over to you to go back to thinking about, you know, those skill sets and, and what did you take from um, your K-12 education? Did you lean on the most? Yeah, that's a great question. And first of all, I'm so glad that you said you call them essential skills and not soft skills. I had written myself a note that one of the things that I think is really important for us to help a lot of times focusing on things you can you can help get there by um, by helping to change the conversation about it. And Kelly, you are terrific about that. So um, as as our other speakers have been too, they aren't soft skills. They are critical. And uh, and we heard that over and over again in the kinds of skills that the kids need. And that's what's so important about STEM education. It's not just about the integrating the science and the mathematics and the technology and, and the uh, engineering. It's about all of those skills and that uh, that curiosity and that that exploration and discovery and critical thinking and problem solving and empathy and all that stuff wrapped into one communication, et cetera. So, um, so I just wanted to lay that out there. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I'm going to throw one other thing in while I can, and then I'll answer the question. And that another thing that I really think, and I heard it a little bit too, but I, I hope we hear it more and more when we talk. I, I, I think we need to change the conversation. I don't see this as an, as the gaps that we have. They are not achievement gaps. They are opportunity gaps. And I just think that's really critical. So I want to throw that out there. So um, for all of you, I want you to know that the skills you have as an educator, as a teacher, as an administrator, all of that, everything that I learned in being a, a teacher and spending all those years in the classroom, those are the exact skills. You guys would all make great astronauts. Those are the exact skills that you need. So think about this. You're working with very complex people in a very complex environment. Uh, everybody's coming with their own strengths and weaknesses. You've got all kinds of problems thrown at you, whether in the classroom in, you know, second grade or in second grade, it would be the bee flies in the window and you've got a whole new thing you have to deal with, right? And you turn that into a learning opportunity. Or as a high school teacher, as a, as a it's not necessarily be in the window, but there are plenty of things going on in high school, et cetera, junior high, middle school, uh, university level. So it, it's all those skills that you use as a teacher, and it's all about learning and um, and uh, lifelong learning and helping helping all of us kind of reach our full potential. Those those are the skills. Um, yeah, those are the skills we already do. So I would say that those were not things that changed when I when I got to NASA. Those are the things I drew on over and over again. I can tell you uh, one thing that is very different that I had to change my mindset on to be two things that I had to change my mindset on to become a good crew member. And one was when we first started, and this is like 180 degrees out from the teaching world, but I sat in, uh, so we start out in our astronaut candidate year, ASCAN year, and we're, Steve and I are with our 30 classmates, and we're all in these big, big classes together, and they go on for several hours. Well, our very first class was kind of an overview of how our year and two years worth of training was going to go, so giving us the big picture. And the first thing they said was, you're going to have a high-level class on space shuttle. And I thought, oh, my gosh. Why are we starting with the highest level? And in the piloting world, high level is that big, you know, the, the sky, the bird's eye view level. So to me, when I think of high level, I'm thinking of we're starting with the hardest class ever, and then it's going to get easier. So that's the kind of thing that I had to learn over and over again was the vocabulary. And I think this is great in the classroom, too. The vocabulary I was bringing meant something entirely different than the vocabulary that I was uh, being exposed to. So that was that was one uh, big, big learning point for me. And I realized once 
once I started learning the language, this new language, even though it was English for me, it was still a brand new language. And once I learned that language, the learning came much, much, much faster um, and easier. And then the second point was, um, so in the classroom, oh, well, let me tell this by the, the first few times when, when I went flying in our T-38s with our instructor pilot. So you go through this whole pre-brief on here's what we're going to do, and this is your job, this is my job with your instructor pilot. These T-38s are very high-performance planes. They fly at 500 miles an hour. They're what the Air Force uses to train its pilots and what NASA uses uh, to because it's the most uh, real it's not a simulator, it's real, but, you know, uh, flying world. And you've got to learn to always be ahead of the aircraft. That's that's kind of a big, big deal in flying. And uh, so we and then we go on these flights and the instructor pilots would, you know, have have me fly and and, uh, you know, work with work with uh, with air traffic control, all the things that we'll be doing on the orbiter to to, to become a pilot. And, uh, you know, my head's just spinning as I'm doing all this. And then we come back and have a debrief afterwards. And in the debrief, the pilot who I every once in a while I'd see them maybe write a tiny little note on their notepad. And that was it. Most of the time, no notes at all. And I would come back and we'd have this debrief. And that that instructor pilot would go through the entire two hour flight and go through every single thing that we did, every single, every single call I made to air traffic control, every call back, every, mo every, you know, every move that I made in the airplane, was able to do the entire thing. And I'm sitting there thinking, and, and then telling me you know, what worked well, what we needed to improve on, et cetera. And I'm sitting there thinking, how can they do that? How can they remember all that and know what hap happened? I can't remember any of that. Other than this is a lot of fun, <laughs> and uh, that was uh, that was just such a shock for me. And then I realized, thinking about it later, wait a minute, they are so comfortable in this world; they've been doing it for so long; it's natural to them. And I started thinking back in the classroom, and thinking, you know, if if somebody were to come into my class and observe, and then leave, and we had a debrief about it. I would be able to say, here's what went on through that entire hour or two hours. And they, they wouldn't be able to. So that was a big learning opportunity for me too, that, a difference. And then one last thing is, and this, um, in the classroom. So I, I mentioned you have to be ahead of the airplane. And, um, so, um, my hardest lesson to learn was, in the classroom, we are always saying, whoops, right? <laughs> so something happens, the kids, you know, one of your kids says something, you say, whoops, you know, and then you talk about it and you think about it and you process it or you're constantly processing, okay, what's what's working now, what isn't, what should I be doing to, to change things a little bit or you're working with your, you know, a student is having a struggle and, and so you're, you're helping them process through that and, you know, an accident happens or just something unusual happens and you just say whoops and you talk about it. You cannot do that in the flying world. And that was the hardest thing for me to do. And I'll, I'll always remember when um, my commander, Scott Kelly, at one point during one of our simulations said, Barb, you cannot say oops. It instills zero confidence in your crewmates. So that was really, really hard hard to learn. And, and what you have to learn in the flying world is acknowledge your mistake quickly, you know, fess up to it, acknowledge it, fix it as quickly as you can, and then move on. Don't sit there and try to analyze it because you're going to end up with more and more and more problems. So that part of that is very different between the classroom and the flying world. Thank you for that. So that leads to another uh, question that we had here. And let me just scroll back up because we have several questions here. Um, I liked this because we started our day with Michael Despazio talking about COVID-19 and really giving us this in-depth view on it. 
And what are your thoughts and what do you want to convey among COVID-19 and the current movement of equity and inclusion for all? And I think you've, you've talked a little bit. You've mentioned some words there and stuff. But what are your thoughts? I mean, there's there's so much struggle right now with this distance learning across STEM. And, you know, we, we've had numerous conversations with our colleagues and even with each other about it, it has to move on from just being worksheets and this interaction here. And I think, you know, out of fairness for everyone, it was shock mode when we went into this whole COVID-19 world it was an absolute shock to say, what do you mean I have one week, if that, to move from my classroom to this remote learning platform? And kudos go out to every single educator out there because, hey, I'm just doing this as a platform for a week. And I'm sure I'm managing presenters. I'm only doing one on one. You know, you're some of you are having 30 kids there. So you know, what, what's some of your insight and what's some of your thoughts around, um, you know, what educators are, are dealing with right now? Yeah. Well, first of all, I echo your words exactly when you were saying that I was the same thing. Kudos, all of you. Teaching is the hardest and most important job in the universe. And then all of a sudden you have this extra, extra challenge thrown at you. So I just really appreciate it. First of all, I hope that you'll be patient with yourself. It's like when I was trying to do new things in my classroom, I wanted everything. I wanted everything to go really, really well, and I realized it, it, it can't. I can't learn that much in that short of a time frame. So I would kind of concentrate on one thing at a time. Maybe one year I'd concentrate on this a little bit more, and then the next year something else. And I was thinking about that too, about STEM and really doing integrated STEM in a way that is that. Uh, that is based on curiosity that opens up all kinds of doors for every single one of our students. This stuff is hard to do. And, and so first thing I would say is be patient. Don't beat yourself up over it. Start one step. You know, if, if we take one in, in the entire fall semester, whether, whether you're on online, whether you're in class or, or whether you're, um, uh, whether you're doing a blended hybrid program or whether you're uh, in a STEM industry that's trying to help out the schools, maybe just one little small step, try, try one project, try, try to turn it into a problem-based um, experience. That's that, and, and yeah, it's not going to go perfectly, but just kind of let it happen and learn from it and learn from the kid you know, learn from the kids because they, they teach us so, so much. So I think that's part of it um, is just being patient and also being persistent you know, and, and stick it with it, sticking with it. The same things we want our students to do. I also think in terms of equity, you know, I look at this COVID thing and the, one of the first, I mean, it's, it is horrible. It's, it, and it's, and it's really horrible for a whole bunch of folks that don't deserve it to be for, for it to be horrible for. And um, I, I, but I look at when you look at the positive side, I think the two things, I think it's, it's science, you know, it is our world. It's an, it's an organism. It's just part of that ecosystem. It's part of the world. And how fascinating is this? I mean, what an incredible, uh, fascinating thing for us all to learn about. And it's and it is STEM too because it's not just the biology or the epidemiology. It's economics. It's it's uh, international uh, relations. You know, it, it's there's just so many different aspects to it, and so it kind of reflects what we're trying to do in the STEM world. And then the other thing that I actually think is a even though I I wouldn't necessarily call it silver because it is such a challenge and and so devastating in so many ways, but that silver lining is that it is truly exposing things um, that, that have, you know, at times in our history have popped up and then they just kind of fizzle away, but it's there and it's endemic. And especially with our, our social, social justice, social equity. And so um, I'm, I'm so glad 
that we're embracing it. And maybe it's okay that this COVID thing is going to take a while before we really can get a handle on it. And it's going to take all of us around the world doing our part. So the longer it takes, the more that social justice is still going to be at the forefront so that we can actually do something about it and not say, not do it for a short period of time and then let it fizzle away again until the next time, you know, it, it comes into our minds or, or our view because we see something horrible happen in the evening news. Well, thank you. Um, I really do appreciate that because I think during this COVID-19 and everything, you know, it's pushed us further, faster than what we may want. Um, but I also think it's a real opportunity for all of us to learn and um, and to figure out new ways to really engage, to make sure we're providing that equity and access for all students. So um, I love the next question here, and I'm going to read this one because this is from I know one of your admirers, David Barnes, um, Barbara, such an honor, um, as you were one of the first and most distant educator, and I love this, and it really was a great distance. Do you have any insights or stories which you could share with us as we are all working to engage in dist distance learning across STEM? Yes, I think and the, and, um, the, so, yeah, let me think about that for a minute. What NASA had in mind that, that how do I put this? <laughs> the biggest challenge for me personally as an educator, and it wasn't just me, it was our team. We had a big education team was uh, in, in coming up with what's the best kind of education we can do on orbit, which for me is it's not about the teacher. And for our education team, we all know it's not about the teacher. It's about the students and how do you engage and involve them in real world learning and hands on and, and minds on and all that stuff. And uh what was interesting to me was the biggest challenge was trying to convince, even though we, this was a follow-on to what Crystal was going to be doing years before, the biggest challenge was convincing um, other folks who, who are in charge of what happened on orbit in the, in the, that this is the right thing to do. So, some folks have the expectation that um, that I should be up there not just as a crew member, but be like Bill and I, the science guy, and put on a show. And Bill puts on great shows, right? But that wasn't I, – I, that's not me, and to me that's not the best kind of education, whether it's in class or virtual. And coming up with virtual is a lot harder. Yes. Um, what I learned from that, so what we did, uh, Dave, we took up 10 million basil seeds and uh, we flew those into space. And that was, uh, we built on on successes previously. And uh, one of our favorite NASA activities from years ago was tomato spirit or uh, tomatoes in space, where uh, one of the early shuttle missions took up a whole bunch of tomato seeds and NASA had this, nat it was national, not international, but they had a national program. Those seeds went on the long duration exposure facility or the LBIF mission. Um, I used them in my classroom. My colleagues used them in their classrooms. And uh, it turned out, and, and those seeds were sent into space at, in the LDF uh, uh, satellite that was released and spent many years on its own being in long duration space. So it was, it had all these different science experiments, materials on it. And then the scientists, once the next space shuttle who was going to bring it back, would bring it back. The scientists could stu study those materials and learn uh, more about what happens to the materials in the vacuum of space, exposure to extreme pressures, temperatures, et cetera. And they had a whole bunch of tomatoes seeds on that. And then, 
Uh, we had the Challenger accident, so those seeds spent an extra long time until one of the follow-on future missions uh, several years later was able to bring the element back. And then those seeds were distributed all around the country, and uh, kids from K through 12, um, pre-K through 12, did all kinds of science with it, whether uh, at, the, at the younger ages it was, you know, studying the growth um, or, uh, you know, and, and the processes uh, and measuring and things like that, kind of real basic stuff, to uh, high school kids doing some DNA studies. But they all contributed whatever data they were collecting mm-hmm. in their classes to a central facility that gathered all of that data. And so it was really a, a real world uh, problem that that everybody was able to contribute to. So it, so for SDS-118, we wanted to build on that, but we also wanted to bring in the engineering piece. And so with those, um, I'm sorry, I realize I'm telling this story and all my other stories are way too long. I apologize. But we wanted to um, uh, challenge the kids to think about, you know, what are we going to do? That you can participate now. You can contribute to what NASA is doing. NASA is trying to get to, back to the moon and onto Mars. What do we need to know? Um, and one of the things we need to know is how are you going to feed people on long duration? You know, how are you going to feed people when you can't, um, uh, when there's nothing growing, you know, on the moon or on Mars, etc. So the challenge was to the kids to think about that. Uh, come up with a lot of different questions and uh, and design and build some kind of growth chamber, whether it's for the moon, Mars, a space shuttle, the space station, your own backyard. And then those 10 million seeds that we took into space, we brought back so they could also do some science with it and come up with experiments. Uh, they were all, they also had their, uh, not just the seeds that flew, but they, they had uh, the seeds that didn't fly so that they had some control you know, some com- comparisons and control variables, et cetera. But I, I've got to say that we had this great plan and it was really hard to convince folks that this is what we should do. And what I learned from that was what what it took to be successful was actually, you know, all of us educators were really excited about it. And we just thought, oh, that enthusiasm, you know, of course everybody's going to be really excited. They weren't. They didn't really understand it in the same visceral way that educators do. And what made it successful were were some of the NASA managers on our team who were not educators. They liked education and they wanted to do things for education, but they weren't educators. You know, they had they had engineering backgrounds and, and business backgrounds and things like that. But they knew how to talk to other managers and engineers and business people. And it was it was actually, we never would have been able to make it happen if it hadn't been for them knowing how to translate that in a way that the folks who were saying yay or nay could could make the decision. And it took a lot of work, you know. It, it took years to make this happen. <laughs> Sorry, I try to keep turning my microphone off just so when you're talking, we don't have any background noise whatsoever. Um, that was a really great story. And, and I think the the whole seed piece of it, it's like you take it for granted. You think, oh, yeah, you just went up there, brought some seeds, and then you brought them back down. But there was such a process with that. And so, you know, applaud everybody there um, that was doing that work there. We have another question coming in from Amy, Amy Yamakawa. Um, how would you suggest teaching these deep lessons of teamwork? So this ties back into this whole thing of the distance learning. Um, you know, individuality and independence in younger generation is becoming part of their education. But how do you suggest that we bring them together? And this whole point now with distance learning. And I think it's something that... Um, you know, educators are struggling with. They're asking this question, you know, it's hard enough to get, you know, my students into a Zoom or into some sort of classroom. 
But how do we do that? You know, whether it's when they go back to the class, we're trying to teach kids, you know, be an individual. But then at the same time, we're saying, hey, it's about teamwork and collaboration and pulling this together. So what thoughts do you have? Yeah, I've got a lot of thoughts on that because I thought about that a lot as a teacher in in the classroom, too. Um, Again, a little easier when it's not, uh, you know, when it's not virtual. However, we've been hearing great ideas on how to do this from our from our other presenters with a lot of different tools. New ones to me. Um, I, I think it kind of goes back to what we're all trying to do and also what it's like uh, to be part of a crew um, on a space mission. First and foremost is what's the goal? What you know? What's the ultimate goal? And I know in our classrooms, um, our ultimate goal, um, and we and we set the tone right away, like day one, we set the tone that um, this is going to be your home away from home. And no matter what kind of situation you come from, it doesn't matter because when you're here, this is your home. And as a and we are family. And as a family, every single person is critical to that family. Everybody has jobs to do. And the more you do your job, the more you contribute and the more you contribute, the, the, you know, the better you feel um, because you're really making a difference. And, and along with that being a family, you've got a goal that you're all working towards. And our goal in, in our classrooms is to ensure that every single individual reaches his or her full potential. And in order to do that, you do that as a family and you do that as a team. And uh, again, back to the COVID, you know, for our, for our kids to understand that, um, that we're all working on this huge challenge, right? And we're doing it together to try, and it's a very big challenge, but we can do it if we do it as a team and every individual contributes their best to it. And we really pay attention to what each other is contributing to it and value it and value their voices. So um, whether you're doing it as a family or a school or a district or a state or a, or a country or the, you know, really it's a world problem as the world. That, to me, that's what's most important. And then, and then as far as how you do it, whether in the classroom or virtually, it's then giving the opportunity and setting up and it take it, this is where it takes a lot of work, but how do you set things up in a way uh, that then you have that opportunity uh, for every individual to contribute and to hear each other as you're all going and, and be that family as you're going towards that, that mission. But again, back to the STEM and integrated STEM, that's what's so wonderful about it because you can, you know, and you make it connected to the real world and you connect with real world people too. So bring, you know, we've got wonderful examples of folks uh, from business and industry who are there and they want to be a part of this. Bring them in. You know, they can they can log on to Zoom or uh, 10, time, 10 times or whatever platform as easily as they can get in their car and drive to your classroom. Well, thank you for that. And I would just say to everybody out there, you know, this is part of our family, right? We're all trying to work towards that common goal of saying that we believe in integrated STEM. We believe in all children and that if we all work together, wherever we are in the world, um, we can we can improve lives. So I believe that wholeheartedly there. So thank you. So I love this question and you're going to love who this question comes from. Um our dear friend Mike Kincaid, <laughs> and he had two. Yes, and he had two parts there. So, I love this. If you could go back in time and talk to your 25 year old self, which was not so long ago, oh, what, right. <laughs> what advice would you give yourself? And then the second part of that is, what lasting impact do you see from NASA's efforts? to select and fly educator astronauts? I love those questions. So you're 25 and you're fly the educator astronauts. Okay, I may ask you questions again uh, real quickly, but first of all, I want everybody to know that Mike Kincaid was part of that team and was one of those, uh, I would say one of three, four 
real leaders who made the difference so that we could do this fantastic program that reached. Um, in fact, I, I got the data here because uh, I, I just want you to know we reached 2.5 million K through 12 students, 150,000 educators, and the thing that I love the most. And Mike, I know you'll be, I'm proud of you for all this, that the percentage of educators at that time who engaged in that, in that, in that project, in that problem solving activity, uh, 56% of those 150,000 educators, that was the first time that they had engaged in, in uh, NASA education in, in their, and brought, brought this kind of learning and research into their classrooms. And that's thanks to, to Mike and a great team. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so back to the question, if I could be my 25-year-old self, what do I need to do? <laughs> there we go. So if you were back to your 25-year-old self, what advice would you give yourself? I'm trying to think what I was doing at 25. I was teaching. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ooh, that's a hard one. Um, I would, I would give. That's a really Mike. That's a tough question <laughs> because there are a lot of things that I would, uh, I would tell myself. But um, you know, I think it goes back to that, that patience, the persistence, the understanding. Sorry, my computer is going to die here. So let me try plug back in, I didn't realize that, um, that there's so much you can learn from so many different people. And I, I think, I think I was kind of doing that at the time, but I just maybe didn't even know where all these different paths would take you. And, and so just, you know, keeping an open mind, staying curious, um, especially as you get older, <laughs> stay curious, stay curious. I know that's not a very good answer, but. Um, yeah. I think it's a great answer. I think that, you know, when we, when we think back to, you know, ourselves 25 years ago, you think back and you're like, so what have I learned kind of on this life's journey here? And I think part of it is that we get, you know, those are things we wanted to be doing, but we get better uh, at it over time which is great. So, um, Kelly, I think one thing that I'm especially thinking about now, um, you know, e even though um, diversity has always been really important to me and, um, you know, one of the reasons I love teaching on the Flathead Reservation and, and all that and, and really paying attention to every single one of our students, there are still many, many things that, you know, that I realize with white privilege that I had not even thought about or considered. And so I would tell my 25 year old self, you need to pay attention to this a lot more and really look deeply at what's going on. Both the stuff that's very visible and the stuff that's very invisible and find that invisible stuff in yourself, find it in your classroom, find it in your community, um, et cetera. Love that. Love that. So the other part two question that Mike asked, what lasting impacts do you see from NASA's efforts to select and fly educator astronauts? Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Mike had a huge part in uh, opening up the program past one guinea pig to bring in more educator astronauts. And we've had three uh, fabulous folks, and we'll have more that have uh, that have flown and are doing. They're great astronauts. They're great teachers, and they're great contributors to what's going on. It. In fact, uh, we've had at, at our STEM summit and other uh, other things that Kelly has been in charge of. Uh, Ricky Arnold, Joe Acaba, in fact, uh, Mike, you interviewed and and did this session like this with uh, Ricky last year. It was fabulous, and Donnie met Kathleen Newberg. Um, and, and we we will have more, hopefully many more. So um, uh, there are a lot of different aspects to that. I think bringing in that voice uh, into the 
program help into the astronaut program helps broaden the perspectives. So it makes for a better team because you've got a lot more diversity. Um, I think more than anything, it's, and I'm grateful to NASA for this, it has given teachers a voice. And um, um, I don't know if you guys know, but from way back from the teacher in space program days, at that time, uh, there was a national report that came out that said um, it, w- it was called a nation at risk. And uh, it basically lambasted public education and uh, it painted the entire public education across the country with the same terrible paintbrush that we were all doing a horrible job. And I will forever be grateful to NASA for being the first federal agency to turn that around um, through the through because Krista McAuliffe, uh, our teacher in space, did such a fabulous job. And it was because NASA had three goals for that program. And the very first goal was raising the prestige of the teaching profession. And that made a huge difference, along with all the STEM kinds of goals as well. Um, And again, I will be forever grateful to that for giving NASA a voice. And then uh, the other part of it is, um, um, you know, working in partnership with NASA's education division. um, Now, sorry, Office of STEM Engagement, which I love that name, it's wonderful, Um, helping to continue to bring that perspective in and just get us closer connected. The the more we can work together, our education, you know, NASA has education as part of its basic mission, that when 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 it was NACA, when it was first developed, education was a big part of it. So bringing it closer together um, helps elevate all of the efforts that Mike and his team that's great yeah well you know i i share the love for mike as well i think what nasa and the team has done there and all of the great presenters and their commitment to educators is just it's amazing and i agree with you i don't think educators would be where they are today without the support and help of nasa as well so So this brings us to our conclusion at the top of the hour to um, your earthlings here. So um, yeah, now you are. So um, I will just say, you know, it's always an honor and a privilege, Barbara, to have you with us to share your insights. And, you know, it's during this time, and I know this isn't how we like to be, um, because I know at this point you would be, having a line of people that would be standing there and asking you, but there's certainly a lot of love that's out there. And we're always just so grateful for the work that you have done and you continue to do and how you continue to inspire each of us every single day. Well, I just want to say, you guys, I'm inspired by you. We're all in this together. And it's such a treat for me to get to learn from all of you. I'd also like to put in a quick plug if I can too. Uh, So tomorrow morning, uh, and all the sessions are fantastic, uh, to learn a little bit more about uh, both uh, NASA opportunities that you get to learn more from Mike and also uh, um, Jessica. Jessica, exactly. And also one of NASA's great partnerships is with the Challenger Center and Lance. In fact, uh, if you want a with all of these folks, along with Bernier and the other folks that are doing a great job showing us different tools, um, you don't have to you don't have to put all this work together yourself. The tools there are tools available out there that you can you can do right now. And some of those, for example, are the uh, classroom adventures that you'll learn about more uh, through Challenger Center. That's just one great example of uh, other great examples that you're doing. So uh, thank you, thank you all just very much. Kelly, thanks to you forever for for this opportunity. Well, thank you, thank you. All right, well, thank you, Barbara. Um, And so to exit the screen, all you gotta do is click that leave button or go backstage, you can do either one there. And I am actually going to call up